Hi, it's Lindsay. Welcome back to The Wandering Reader. Today I'm going to be doing my March book haul. I acquired quite a few books in March. Um, a lot of them I didn't pay full price for. I got from um, some charity shops. Um, so I'm just going to jump into what I got this month. First of all, I picked up a copy of We Shall Be Feminists by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. It was International Women's Day a few weeks ago now and um, I read an article um, about her in Red magazine um, and this has kind of been around our booktube for a while and people have been talking about it kind of in general and um, this was originally a TED talk that she did um, and then they kind of printed it as a sort of mini book it's only sort of 50 pages long or something like that um, but it's all obviously like the title said all about um, how uh, we should all be feminists. So um, I've actually got this on my Goodreads like reading at the moment. Um, I don't think it will take me that long to get through, um, but I picked that one up. Next up, I picked up a copy of The Breakdown by B.A. Paris. This is a thriller um, and she wrote Behind Closed Doors, um, which I believe came out last year, I think, and was very successful. Um, I haven't read that one. I saw this in my local supermarket. Um, I thought I'd give it a go. A couple of people um, that I'm kind of friends with on Instagram and things have recommended this recently. So this says on the back, it started that night in the woods. Cass Anderson didn't stop to help the woman in the car and now she's dead. Ever since silent calls have been plaguing Cass and she's sure someone is watching her. Consumed by guilt, she's also starting to forget things. Whether she took her pills, what her house alarm code is, and if the knife in the kitchen really has blood on it. If you can't trust yourself, who can you trust? So, like I said, I'm really looking forward to giving that a go. I do like um, a good thriller every now and again. I actually haven't read one this year yet, so maybe this will be the first one that I pick up. Then I picked up a copy of Hidden Figures and this is by Margot Lee Shetterly. So this is the film tie-in edition. Again, I picked this up at my local supermarket. The film has been doing really well in cinemas. It's out at the moment, um, but I don't like uh, what going to watch a film first. I prefer reading the book first. Um, so um, I picked up a copy of this. Um, this is all about the women that um, were behind um, some of the NASA discoveries and things. Um, and the women that weren't recognised at the time. Um, so I think this is going to be a good one. It says at the top, the untold story of the African-American women who helped win the space race. Um, so yeah, it's got a really good cast um, in the film. And um, But like I said, I want to read the book first, so I picked myself up a copy of this. Then again, inspired by something that's just um, started um, on Sky Atlantic, I picked myself up a copy of Big Little Liars by Leanne Moriarty. I've never read anything by this author before, but I have heard good things about her. She wrote Truly Madly Guilty, which people have been um, talking about um, sort of over the last six months or so. Um, yeah, they've just made this um, into a HBO series and um, I think I, the, they've aired a couple of episodes so far. I, I haven't watched them, but I've taped them. Um, so, um, and it's got people like Reese Witherspoon and Nicole Kidman and uh, Shalene Woodley, is that how you say that? I don't know. Um, so it's got a really good cast in it. You just tend to find that with more TV now, don't you? That lots of Hollywood stars are turning to TV more, perhaps more than they are film, which is really interesting. Um, but this, I believe, is about three mums um, and some sort of mystery, so probably better if I read the back. Um, Jane hasn't lived anywhere for longer than six months since her son was born five years ago. She keeps moving in an attempt to escape her past. Now the idyllic coastal town of Pirawi has pulled her to its shores and Jane feels as if she finally belongs. She finds friends in the feisty Madeline and the incredibly beautiful Celeste, two women with seemingly perfect lives and their own secrets. But at the start of a new term, an incident involving the children of all three women occurs in the playground, causing a rift between them and the other parents. Minor at first, but escalating fast, until the whispers and rumours become vicious and spiteful and the truth blur, truths blur into lies. It was always going to end in tears, but no one thought it would end in murder. So, um, yeah, the, um, the trailer for the TV series looked really, really good. Um, so I'm looking forward to picking that one up before I give the TV series a go. And then I picked myself up this. This is called Before the Rains by Dina Jeffries. I've seen quite a lot of Dina Jeffries' work about. I've got some of her novels on my Kindle, actually. And I came across this hardback 
um, book and it was something like six pounds in my local supermarket. The cover is absolutely beautiful and that's what drew me to it first of all and then the price, it was such a good price for a hardback book um, so I couldn't really um, turn it down really. Um, and this one says uh, 1930 Rad Rajputana, India, apologies if I've pronounced that wrong, uh, since her husband's death, 28-year-old photojournalist Eliza's only companion has been her camera. When the British government sent her to an Indian princely state to photograph the royal family, she's determined to make a name for herself. But when Eliza arrives at the palace, she meets Jay, the prince's handsome brooding brother. While Eliza awakens Jay to the poverty of his people, he awakens her to the injustices of British rule. Soon Jay and Eliza find they have more in common than they think, but their families and society think otherwise. Eventually they will have to make a choice between doing what's expected or following their hearts. Um, so that sounds like it's going to be really good, a good bit of historical fiction there. And then the other set of books I've got to show you are ones that I picked up in a charity shop for, um, for quite cheap. Um, I've got quite a few of them here to show you. Um, so the first one that I'm going to show you is this tome. <laughs> Um, it's called The Pillars of the Earth by Ken Follett. Um, a friend of mine on Facebook um, read this and really, really enjoyed it. And I believe they've made this into a TV series, I think. I don't think it's a film. It's a massive kind of historical fiction novel, and it is massive. Um, and I want to say that this is part of a series. I could be wrong about that, but it's it's a thousand pages long. So this says on the back... Set in the turbulent times of 12th century England, when civil war, famine, religious strife and battles over royal succession tore lives and families apart, the pillars of the earth tells the story of the building of a magnificent cathedral. Against this richly imagined backdrop, filled with intrigue and treachery, Ken Follett draws the reader irresistibly into a wonderful epic of family drama, violent conflict and unswerving ambition. From humble stonemason to imperious monarch, the dreams, labours and loves of his characters come vividly to life. The Pillars of the Earth is without doubt a masterpiece and has proved to be one of the most popular books of our time. So this has been on my Amazon wishlist for a while and I picked it up in a charity shop. It's got this ridiculous sticker on the front, I must get rid of that, um, for I think a pound. <laughs> it's such a big book for a pound. Um, so yeah, I couldn't really resist that one. Then I've got here a copy of Wild Swans, uh, Three Daughters of China by Young Chang, I think that's how you pronounce that. I had a copy of this quite a few years ago now on my shelf and I got rid of it in the end because I never got around to reading it. Um, but it's supposed to be a really, really good multi-generational novel following um, women, uh, generations of women in China. Um, and I've heard very, very good things about it. It pops up on lots of sort of best li seller lists and things like that. Um, and I saw it in the charity shop again and I, I thought, well, I'll pick it up again and give it a go. And actually, when I got to the till with it, the women behind the till both said, oh, we've read that and that's a really good one. Um, so that was a great recommendation. Um, so at some point, I'll pick that up and give that one ago. Next up I picked myself up um, a hardback copy of A Year of Marvellous Ways by Sarah Women. I have already read this, I've got a paperback copy of it on my shelf, but I saw this pretty pristine sort of edition, hardback edition of um, the book again in a charity shop and just couldn't resist it really. It was, it is, I do really like Sarah Women as an author. Um, I just thought it was one of my favourite books of last year. Um, so I couldn't really resist picking up the hardback edition of it. So like I said, I've, I've already read this, but I've just added it to my collection. Next up, I've got a copy of The 13th Tale by Diane Setterfield. Um, this is one that people talk about quite a lot on BookTube. Um, and I've had it on my Amazon wishlist for a while. So I saw this um, and I thought I'd pick it up. Um, this is um, a historical fiction novel, which I believe centres around kind of like an old house and a mystery and things. So the back says, um, Angel Field House stands abandoned and forgotten. It was once the imposing home of the March family. Fascinating, manipulative, manipulative Isabel, Charlie, her brutal and dangerous brother, and the wild, untamed twins, Emmeline and Adeline. But Angelfield House conceals a chilling secret whose impact still resonates. Now Margaret Lee is investigating Angelfield's past, and the mystery of the March family starts to unravel. What has the house been hiding? What is its connection with the enigmatic author Vox? Vida Winter and what is it in Margaret's own travel past that causes her to fall so powerfully under Angelfield's spell. Um, so that sounds really interesting, sort of historical fiction that's jumping between the past and the present, 
got kind of like different narrators in there um, and I've heard good things about it so that's that one. And then I found, uh, this is a really good find as well, I found a hardback copy of Disgrace by J.M. Coetzee, I think you pronounce that. Again, it's a pristine copy, this cost me 20p, um, so I couldn't really resist. This won the, the Booker Prize in 1999. Um, but I couldn't really resist this one. This is um, a bit of a classic, really. Um, so this says on the inside, um, David Lurie, middle-aged and twice divorced, is a scholar fallen into disgrace. After, teaching ye after years teaching romantic poetry at the Technical University of Cape Town, he has an impulsive affair with a student. The affair sours. He is denounced and summoned before a committee of inquiry. Willing to admit his guilt, but refusing to yield to pressure to repent publicly, he resigns and retreats to an isolated small holding owned by his daughter Lucy. For a time, his daughter's influence and the natural rhythms of the farm promise to harmonise his discordant life. He helps with the dogs in the kennels, takes produce to market and assists with treating injured animals at a nearby refuge. But the balance of power in the country is shifting. He and Lucy become victims of a savage and disturbing attack which brings into relief all the fault lines in their relationship. So, um, it's, um, I've not really read a lot of things that are set in South Africa. Um, in fact, have I read anything? I don't think I have. Um, so this is quite a short one as well, so it should be quite quick to get through. So I was really pleased to pick that um, nice hardback edition of that up. The next one I have is a hardback edition of See Me by Nicholas Sparks. Um, I used to have quite a few Nicholas Sparks books on my shelf and I, I got rid of them a few years ago. Um, I'm a quite a big fan of his films, especially The Notebook. Um, and I, I watched one on on the way to Florida a couple of years ago I can't remember the name of now but I really enjoyed it um, I found this hardback edition of this one I've not heard of this one before um, he's a very prolific sort of would you call him a YA author I don't really know maybe something in between YA and adult um, but they're kind of easy sort of romance sort of driven reads um, so I saw this hardback edition and I thought I'd pick it up when I'm in the mood for something a bit sort of lighter um, I think I've tended to prefer his the, the sort of film versions of his books in the past but I haven't read all of them so um, yeah I couldn't really pass up the opportunity to pick that one up. The next one I have to show you is The Loop by Nicholas Evans. Um, this is the author of The Horse Whisperer and I have a really battered copy of The Horse Whisperer on my shelf. Um, that I read quite a few years ago now and absolutely loved it, it was brilliant. I haven't yet got around to watching the film, but I really liked the book, it was kind of set in um, sort of the the Rockies and what am, I, what am I trying to say, it was set kind of like in out, Outback America, is that a thing? I don't know, anyway you probably know what I mean, um, and kind of in the wilds of America and things and it was really good at the time and I, I found this copy of The Loop, I've not really heard anything about this before, in fact um, I've never really sort of investigated his other novels, uh, but I found this one in pretty pristine condition, uh, so I thought I'd pick it up and this says on the back, Helen Ross, a 29 year old biologist, is sent to a sleepy rocky mountain ranching town to defend a pack of wolves from those who want to destroy them. For a century ago in Hope, Montana, the wolf was slaughtered to extinction and though now protected by law as an endangered species, the old hatred runs deep. Alone in this hostile place, bruised by a broken love affair, Helen struggles for self-esteem and survival, embarking on a dangerous alliance with the son of her most ferocious opponent, the brutal and charismatic rancher, Buck Calder. From its heart-stopping first chapter to its devastating climax, The Loop, set in the same vast landscape as The Horse Whisperer, is an epic tale of primal passion and redemptive love. So like I said, I really enjoyed The Horse Whisperer before, um, so I'll see whether this one is sort of, well, whether I enjoy this the same, really. Next up, I've got a bit to kind of, that kind of makes me feel really nostalgic, really. Um, I picked up a couple, cu <laughs> I picked up a couple? I picked up a copy of The Borrowers by Mary Norton. Um, I read this as a child and really, really loved it. And I saw this copy of it and it just brought back so many nice memories of really enjoying the story. This is a sort of children's classic 
um, novel about some really tiny people um, and their kind of life living in this house trying to hide from the family that live there and things and I just remember loving it as a child so I couldn't really pass up the opportunity of picking it up again. Now I'll reread it at some time and see yeah just let the memories flow back to me. <laughs> Next up I have a copy of Falling Angels by Tracy Chevalier um, I believe that Tracy Chevalier is a sort of huge historical fiction writer. Um, sort of, she's supposed to be quite good. I've never read anything by her before, and I spotted this copy um, in the charity shop. So this says on the back, um, January 1901, the day after Queen Victoria's death, two families visit neighbouring graves in a fashionable London cemetery. The waterhouses revere the late Queen and cling to Victorian traditions. The Colemans look forward to a more modern society. To their mutual distaste, the families are inextricably linked when their daughters become friends behind the tombstones. As the girls grow up and a new role for women emerges, as cars replace horses and electricity outshines gas lighting, the nation emerges from the shadows of oppressive Victorian values to a golden Edwardian summer. So that sounds like it's going to be really good. It sounds like it's going to kind of open my eyes a lot to that particular time period, what life was like, um, and the story sounds really intriguing as well. Uh, next I have a copy of The Atlas of Us by Tracy Buchanan. I think yeah, that's how you pronounce that. I've never heard of this novel before, but I was kind of intrigued by the cover of it and then what it said on the back. So it says, Louise Fenton flies to a devastated Thailand in ser to search for her mother, missing following the Boxing Day tsunami. The only trait she can find is her mother's distinctive bag. Inside it is a beautifully crafted atlas belonging to a writer named Claire Shreve. But what is the connection between Claire and Louise's missing mum, and can the Atlas help Louise find her? As Louise explores the mementos and notes slipped between the pages of the Atlas, she learns the story of a life-changing revelation, a tragedy and a passionate love affair, and she uncovers a secret that nearly destroyed Claire and the man she loved, the same secret her mother has been guarding all these years. So it kind of says on the back, if you like Victoria Hislop and Santa Montefiore, then you'll love this one um, and I've read I think I've read one each by them before um, so yeah I'm just intrigued by the cover and the blurb and decided to um, add that to my collection and then finally the last two novels that I picked up are both novels by Liz Trinnell I mentioned Liz Trinnell in my last book haul and um, I went to meet her at a Waterstones event and just coincidentally the two other novels that I hadn't owned by her I found in a charity shop. I was so pleased to come across them. And they are um, The Last Telegram and The Forgotten Seamstress. Um, I, can't, I think this one was her first novel. Um, so The Last Telegram says on the back, As the Nazis storm Europe, Lily Verner becomes an apprentice at her family's silk weaving factory. When they begin to weave parachute silk, there is no margin for error. One tiny fork could result in certain death for Allied soldiers. The war also brings Stefan to Lily, a German Jewish refugee who works on the looms. As their love grows, they are, there are suspicions someone is tampering with the silk. Can their love survive the hardships of war and will the Werner's silk stand the ultimate test? So that kind of, it's, it's, it's got like the silk weaver feel, uh, theme in it that then um, her most recent novel has so that sounds interesting and then the forgotten seamstress this says on the back when caroline meadows discovers a beautiful quilt in her mother's attic she sets out on a journey to discover who made it and the meaning of the mysterious message embroidered into its lining many years earlier just before the first world war casts its shadow maria a talented seamstress from the east end of london is employed to work for the royal family Young and attractive, she soon catches the eye of the Prince of Wales and becomes captivated by the glamour and intrigue of palace life. But careless talk causes trouble and soon Maria's life takes a far darker turn. Can Caroline piece together the secret history and reveal the truth behind what happened to Maria? Um, so yeah, I'm really glad to have all of her novels now. Um, I'm kind of wondering whether to pick up her old ones first and then read The Sil Silk Weaver, which is her most recent one, or 
to read the silk weaver first because I was really kind of intrigued by that but we'll see I'll work it out so there you go guys they were all of the uh, things that I picked up in March have you read any, read any of these have you got any thoughts on them uh, which one do you think I should pick up first uh, please leave me some comments down below I'd love to have a chat with you thanks very much for watching and I'll see you in my next video bye